Perhaps you'd like to tell us about you, who you are, and about your general research interests. Okay, um, I'm, my name's Grant Big. I'm um, head of the Department of Geography here in Sheffield, but uh, have a, a background very much more in the, in the hard sciences, in maths and physics. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what your current research interests are. How have you brought together this background that you have in what you call hard science with the geography and so on that you're now more focused on? Yes, well, my main interest is uh, in the way the oceans and the climate interact, and mostly on large scales. So um, th this particular picture is, is looking at the large-scale circulation in, uh, in the ocean. It's called the, the thermohaline circulation, which is the primary thing I study, um, which basically says how um, heat gets into the North Atlantic it's extracted from the North Atlantic Ocean into the atmosphere and then the cold, dense water sinks and goes back around the global ocean and through various processes comes back to the surface. And it's the mechanisms by which this, this process works um, that I'm interested in on a range of timescales. So uh, what's going on now, how variable is it over the last few decades, what was it like during the last glacial period? So, so trying to think about changes in the ocean and the way they interact with the atmosphere on a variety of scales. When, when you're looking at, at Earth processes, uh, uncertainty is really underlies everything, um, particularly when you're looking at fluids like the atmosphere and ocean, because they're inherently unpredictable. And you start off with uh, one state and uh, according to, to models, which is what uh, I use a lot to, to study the processes, uh, depending on whether you start in one state or one slightly different, you can end up in, in totally different states um, and, and, and really dramatic differences, not just kind of minor um, perturbations to temperature or something. So that, that inherent uncertainty is, is a real characteristic of the whole um, climate system and the various scales going from global down to, to local. You talked about small changes in the inputs uh, making p p potentially large and unpredictable changes in the outputs. Can you give us an example? Weather forecasting is a, is a really good um, example of that. You see on the, the news television or here on the radio um, what sounds like a very deterministic and exact forecast that it, it will rain tomorrow at a certain time and so on for a certain place. There's a lot of uncertainty about um, how the weather will actually evolve. Mm -hmm. And as you go further away from, from now into the future, that uncertainty grows. And this is a, a picture um, which is showing a forecast um, for different parameters, different climate parameters in London for about a, a two-week period um, back at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. um, the top picture is, is a temperature in central London um, over the two-week period, and then you've got the wind speed, and um, this is accumulated precipitation. Okay. And all the different lines on the diagram are showing different uh, weather forecast model simulations of how the climate, how the, uh, the weather should evolve over that two-week period. Mm -hmm. And the blue and, and red lines are, are two specific models uh, and the yellow one is a, a mean of all, all of these these models and you can see that uh, initially the models are predicting very similar things but after a few days they start to drift apart mm -hmm. and by the time you've got four or five days you can have really totally different uh, forecasts of conditions uh, between different models and this is a very characteristic property of weather forecasting. Uh, the, there are various sorts of errors which you propagate and you have to deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. and the same thing is true when you go to much larger scales in climate modelling. Uh, I, mean, I guess one, one of the things we should do is to just be clear here the difference between, in your mind, between weather and climate. You've, you've been talking about both. And uh, it's, I think it's almost certainly the case that you mean something quite different. In yes. some senses, by yes. one or the other, so perhaps you could tell us more. Yes, well, weather is very much the change in the atmosphere or, or, or ocean um, on scales of a few days. 
So today it's raining. Um, yesterday we had dry periods. The sort of change that you get over over a few days to a week or two, where you've got a lot of variability from day to day. That's really the weather. Um, but the climate is where you're looking at, at rather longer time scales. So it could be thinking about um, a year, a decade, uh, could even be a thousand years, where you're thinking about variations uh, which tend to be averaged out and give you when you look at the averages, you get change which is much slower. I understand now that probabilities are routinely calculated. Are they also routinely part of the research discussion? So if you're talking to a colleague, at what point do you start discussing probability? So the general public hear lots of qualitative yes. stuff coming out of weather forecasting and so on. And I would like to get a feel for how quantitative your discussions of uncertainty are. At the forecasting end, and thinking about this, the short time scales, um, uncertainty is, is, is mostly used from the beginning because it's, it's an inherent factor of, of doing things like weather forecasting or ocean forecasting or, or even short term climate forecasting, like in this, this picture. You, you, you have to talk about the uncertainties from the beginning. Um, that's a relatively new feature, I guess. 20 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. You would have seen a model result, and that's what you would have accepted as was going to happen, knowing that there was a likelihood that it wouldn't be perfect. Um, but, but now, probability and certainty has really become integral. When you're looking further into the past, um, or at longer time scales, there's, there's less chance you to do comparisons. Um, so, for instance, if you're using um, looking at marine sediment cores to try and infer temperatures over the North Atlantic um, 20,000 years ago, you won't have very many places where you can, you can use data from the, the sediment cores and plankton. Um, so, you won't have very many data points on which to base your estimate. And so the error, uh, quite often the concept of error doesn't enter in nearly the same way. It's there in the background rather than at the forefront, mm -hmm. I think, in that sort of research. But if you're basing uh, interpretations on five data points, for example, it, it would seem to, I think, to some people that your incentives must be bigger. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's, um, and again, I think this is... Um, where environmental science is going through a transition. And, and, and things like um, meteorology and, and uh, forecasting oceanography have already gone through this transition and treat, treat taste, and certainly very carefully. Um, but still, in a lot of large scale studies, people are, are looking at one result and making a lot of inferences from that. Um, and a, a good example is the the measurement of that overturned circulation that I mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, after they had one year of measurements, there was a paper that came out in, in the journal Nature saying that uh, you know, when you look at data every 15 or 20 years over the last 40 years, there's this dramatic decrease in, in the strength of the overturning. But when they had an extra year and a half, they just found that what had actually happened is that each time in that, that those half dozen measurements, they'd sample a different part of this rather variable system. I see. So it's that, that kind of understanding of what the real variability in the system is, is, is only just beginning to be understood for um, larger scale and, and longer processes. Okay, so I'm, I know that you're interested generally in um, fairly big picture parts of the stories where some people are focusing on the details. And that makes me think it would be useful to have a little chat about um, the really biggest picture. So, for you, to what degree is uncertainty simply part of the fabric of the universe? <laughs> I think it is part of the, the fabric of, of, um, of the world and, and, and beyond. The uncertainty is there and, and, and chaos is, a, is something which keeps coming up in all sorts of different areas. You, you just cannot ever 
really precisely know what's going on. There is uncertainty, um, whether you're at, at, at global scales or down at subatomic levels. So I think uncertainty is, is, is a fact of life and you have to, to deal with it. Um, I think science is, is evolving to try and uh, understand that uncertainty. I mean, it's rather than um, throwing, their, throwing their hands up and saying, well, we can't deal with it or ignoring it. It's actually, in the last century, I think, perhaps starting with atomic physics and, and, and moving up in scale, we've had to come to grips with how science and uncertainty interact. Mm -hmm. And it's actually telling us more about the system because it's the, the uncertainty which often um, tells us about it a part of the system that we don't normally get the chance to observe. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Winstonley. I work on black holes and I work on fundamental mathematical ideas about black holes. So I'm not interested so much in what they look like out there in the universe. I'm more interested in the equations that describe black holes, both in Einstein's general relativity and using um, quantum field theory as well. And more recently, I've got interested in the idea of whether we can make black holes at the Large Hadron Collider. Excellent, excellent. Um, and so we're here to talk about uncertainty, and is this something that features in your research? It definitely does feature, it depends a little bit on what I'm trying to do. So, with black holes, fundamentally, there is a lot of uncertainty because a black hole is a region inside which you can't see. You don't know what's going on, so you have complete uncertainty yes, yes. About, about that aspect of it. Now, in fact, those of us who research on black holes are so used to it, we don't worry about that because that's... Um, that's there all, all the time and we're, and we're used to it. So certainly uncertainty in terms of things that we don't know and very often you're trying to find out something. You're trying to work out an answer about some particular property of a black hole and you don't know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> so it's to some extent it's about trying to limit your uncertainties to find out things that you didn't know um, and more recently when I've been talking to experimentalists uncertainty there is very important because they're actually dealing with real data but the key thing where uncertainty comes in is in terms of what are your assumptions that you're putting into your model that you're putting into your calculation and do you have a good feeling about whether those assumptions are reasonable or indeed true? And do, do you go to any measures to try and minimise your uncertainty to, to improve these assumptions that you're making? Well, there's always a trade-off between making a lot of assumptions which gives you a simpler model, which is easier to, to work with and easier to calculate things in, or trying to reduce the number of assumptions and therefore then ending up with a model that's so complicated that you can't do anything at all. Now very often because I'm interested in fundamental ideas to do with black holes I will quite often make a lot of assumptions because I want a simple model that I can work with very precisely and get very precise answers out in the context of those assumptions. And then I might change those assumptions, change my model, and then look at what difference that makes to the answer that I'm getting. Mm. Um, so with the models that you're using, uh, could you give an example of the kinds of assumptions you're having to make and, and, and deal with? So I've recently been involved in looking at what happens to a black hole if we make one at the Large Hadron Collider. And initially, people looked at the very simplest type of black hole, which is one which isn't spinning. And in that case, you can calculate the particles that the black hole is going to emit. And the calculations aren't 
horrendously difficult. And then our experimental colleagues could translate those calculations into what they would see in the detector. So what I was involved with was relaxing that assumption that the black hole wasn't spinning and introducing spin into the model, which made the calculations much harder. But what we found was that that changed the particles that were emitted by the black hole and it changed what the experimentalists would see in their detectors. Now, so we've refined our model and it's made a change in the experimental predictions, but of course there are still lots of assumptions in what the black hole looks like because we need to keep it simple enough that we can do the calculations. But of course we don't know if we made our model more complicated, whether it would have a big change in the experimental signatures. How would you say uncertainty is dealt with in general in your field? It depends a lot on the sort of questions that I'm trying to answer. So my research varies from really trying quite abstract and trying to prove things, when you have to be very clear about what you've prove, proven, and about what is conjecture, about what you think is true, and that you may have evidence for, but you can't prove, it's not watertight evidence. And so that's one end of my research. In the middle, there are sort of calculating things, and the uncertainty there is, well, how confident are you that these complicated calculations are right? Mm. And then in the more experimental end, there is uncertainty in the sense of data, in the sense of trying to model a real-world system and how accurate is your model in terms of what is actually happening in the real world. But does how you were taught about uncertainty differ from how you would like to teach about it? So when I was thinking about this question, I couldn't remember a time when I was actually really taught about uncertainty at least not in the sense in which you mean it. Mm. I think what I was very much taught about is about being clear about the assumptions that you're making in your modelling and testing whether those assumptions are reasonable or not, or at least having a good intuition about mm. that. Or if you like, this is about looking at the limitations of your, of your model. So for example, going back to back holes at the Large Hadron Collider, we assume that the black hole can be described by general relativity. So that's an assumption. Now, we don't have any evidence for black holes at the LHC, so we don't have a test of how good an assumption that is. So we have to think about it from a theoretical point of view and make arguments about, well, in a certain case, this is going to be a reasonable assumption and we can argue that what we're ignoring is small. Okay, so as, as your field of research progresses and evolves, do you think the way in which uncertainty will be dealt with will change? At well, my answer to that is going to be I don't know, which is very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very uncertain, uncertain about that. I think um, as models get ever more complicated as we seek to have ever more sophisticated models of the fundamental laws of the universe, we do need to be clearer about what our assumptions are, about what the foundations of our model are, and about what our model is describing. Um, but I think in general in, in mathematical physics we are we are quite clear about that, although quite often this you know, causes considerable discussion. <laughs> okay, that's brilliant. So, do you see uncertainty as something within the fabric of our universe? Absolutely. Um, so I work with two fundamental theories in physics. I work with general relativity and I work with quantum theory. And one of the fundamental laws of quantum theory, something called the uncertainty principle. And what the uncertainty principle tells us is that we cannot measure everything about a quantum system. So for example, we cannot measure both the position and the momentum of a quantum particle to arbitrary accuracy. 
And that's not because we can't build good enough measuring systems or things like that. There's a, there's a fundamental uncertainty in the properties of the particles in our universe. And while quantum theory is the theory of the very small, one of the things that I'm interested in is combining that with general relativity, which is the theory of the very big. And that should give us what we call a final theory, a theory of quantum gravity that will describe everything. And that must include this uncertainty idea that's in quantum theory. So I think that uncertainty is, it's a part of the fundamental laws which govern the universe. Okay. So you're building black holes at the LHC, which sounds Maybe. Like, a, <laughs> like a big project. Um, and there's going to be uncertainty about your results and what comes up there. Uh, and are you concerned that something completely uh, unbelievable, uh, unfathomable, could, could result from these experiments? That's a very good question, Ben. And it's one that I get asked a lot when I'm giving talks, particularly to the general public, about making black holes at the Large Hadron Collider. And they say, well, there's a lot of things you don't know. And could it be that even though you don't, you don't know this, could it be that actually you could make a black hole and it could swallow the whole of the, the Earth? And I say, say no, I'm, I'm sure it couldn't. And they say, well, how, how do you know? And the answer to that particular question comes from looking at a completely different system, which is from looking at cosmic rays hitting the Earth. And it turns out that these models that predict that we could make black holes at the Large Hadron Collider also would predict that you make black holes in cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are bombarding the Earth all the time, and the Earth's still here. So if we'd made a black hole, it's not swallowed at the whole Earth, so everything's okay. So the moral of this story is even though you have a lot of uncertainties in your model, sometimes some completely different area of physics or a completely different system that has those same uncertainties can nonetheless answer the question that you're, that you're interested in. And I want you to rest easy in your bed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mike Savajothi. I'm the Professor of Entomology here in the Department of Animal and Plant Sciences at the University of Sheffield. So I, I did a, a degree in zoology and um, decided I wanted to do research. I went, I, I was very interested in the way, in you know, trying to understand the way that animals behave, but trying to understand the physiology that underpinned mm -hmm. that. And the kind of framework for all of this was, was evolution and, and how evolution shaped those physiological processes and why you got behavior, and particularly actually the variation in that behavior, mm -hmm. why you saw this. The research I do now uh, has kind of, it's, it's gone in a slightly different direction. So, so I'm less interested now in the behavior, but I'm still interested in the physiological underpinnings of um, what, what we might call the emergent phenotype, the way the animal is, or, and, and that includes behavior as well. And so the two core things that I'm interested in are uh, the immune system of insects and how the immune system functions and how it's coordinated in a successful attack against pathogens mm -hmm. and, and also of course by definition how does it fail and how does it fail to protect the animal. So that's, that's one set of, of, of research uh, objectives or ideas. And the other is a, a still on the theme of reproduction trying to understand the evolutionary processes that shape the interactions between males and females during reproduction. And, and to put that in a nutshell the consensus or the, the kind of lay belief is that um, males and it's the one time in an organism's life when the interests of both individuals are the same to come together and to produce offspring but actually what um, what modern empirical biology and actually evolutionary theory sh tells us and shows us is that that's one of the most intense conflicts um, that happens between individuals within a population in fact the intensity of that conflict is as strong as the conflict between a pathogen and a host. So the kind of coevolution you see between viruses and, and humans is, is pretty much 
uh, acted out between males and females during during the, their their interests in mating. So that that's my kind of broad research interest. And within this uh, general research interest, is uncertainty relevant, uh, or is something that you explore, something that you might even embrace? Yeah, let me start off by telling you the kinds of uncertainty that um, that that I that biologists in general and I in particular have to deal with, and and how those map on to, to maybe what the uncertainty that, that, you, that you're conceptualizing. So I think actually there are two, there are t two main kinds of uncertainty that, that biologists, behavioral biologists deal with, or biologists actually, mm -hmm. let's, let's deal with the whole lot first. Um, one is what you might call statistical uncertainty, and, and we label that probability. So, mm -hmm. And, and that, that is primarily derived, well, you can break that into two different units. As, a, as an empirical biologist, that, you can break that into two units. One, is, one comes from variation in natural systems. Okay? So it's a fundamental feature of biological systems that they have variation. Uh, in fact, that is one of the drivers of evolutionary processes. If you have no variation, um, then there's nothing for selection to act on, so evolution stops. So, so if you look at populations, if you look at you and me, we're different. And you don't see similar individuals in humans, very rarely, with, with a few very kind of rare um, genetic and developmental situations do you, do you see different individuals. And, and likewise, that's true in most animals. Um, the, the vast majority of organisms, in fact. There are some organisms that are clonal, but, but let's put those to one side, mm -hmm. a slightly different issue. So the point I'm making there is one, one thing that all biologists generally have to deal with, particularly if you're dealing with ecological, real-world situations, is variation. Um, and that, in, inherent in that, is the notion of uncertainty. Um, the other thing that empirical biologists have to deal with is uncertainty in the methods that they're using to measure the phenomena they're looking at. So you've effectively got two sources of variation. So if I, if I, measure, uh, if I measure the diameter of this table with a tape measure, um, I, it will come to 1.5 meters. If I give you the tape measure, you'll measure it at 1.5 meters. So there seems to be no variation. But if I then give you the same tape measure and say, right, now measure it in millimeters, you might come to 1,510, I might come to 1,509. So we've immediately got variation. And it's not because the table is varying, it's because of our measurement, the, ver the precision or variation in our measurement, our measurement error is varying. And in a table that's, you know, a table that's one and a half meters wide, that's a very, very small amount of error. But when you're looking at biological systems, uh, in, in actually in some cases in very complicated, complex ways, that error can be quite significant. So I'll give you an example of that, if, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that'll be So there was a, a few years ago, there was a field of biology um, that uh, believed, uh, that tested the idea that symmetry in, in the face or, in, or in, actually in, in, in animal structures mm -hmm. in general was very important in determining uh, reproductive success. So the, and that's, this has kind of crept into the uh, Darwinian psychology literature as well, that humans with symmetrical faces more are more attractive. attractive. And, and the psychologists have solved this in a very clever way, the measurement error problem, by creating computer models so that, so that the, what they're doing is showing you manipulated images which they know exactly how they've been manipulated. But the early work involved having to measure symmetry. And that caused a real problem because you then had to define what facial symmetry was and what, how much your measurement error contributed towards that. And it turned out in a lot of cases, actually, that the measurement error was greater than the variation the in the variation. symmetry that they were trying to measure. And, and in complex structures, it becomes almost impossible. So, so that's another source of variation. So we have, so biologists, field biologists are faced with two problems. The, the variation in measuring stuff and the variation that the stuff has anyway. And those two obviously compound each other. Mm -hmm. to, make, to make identifying real phenomena slightly more tricky, there's a little bit more uncertainty involved in, in how you define those. Parameters. So that so that's 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 the way I that's the world that I live in biologically. Another new area where uncertainty is playing a really interesting role, I think, is the question of extinction and and saving uh, how you know whether something's extinct or not. And the problem, the uncertainty here comes because as animals become rare, they become harder to find in the environment. But it boils down to this: 
if we've been in this habitat and we've sampled for 10 years and we've never found the spotted Wollonga, is it extinct or have we just failed to find it? And, and what they've done is they've used data from real world situations to look at how those sampling curves um, produce rare animals and at what point you can say with certainty, actually, it's not here anymore, it's gone. So I think that's a, that's a kind of relevant and, and actually pretty important use of, of uncertainty in, in biological systems. Do I embrace uncertainty? The, the answer to that, well, I, I have no choice. The, the world I live in is, is a variable world filled with not just biological variation, but variation in the methods I use. So uncertainty is, is, is our bread and butter. If you look at any biological journal, any biological uh, results in any biological journal, you'll see that every statement of fact is, is backed, although the, the fact, the statement is there as quite a, a, a bold statement, it's backed up actually with the statistical analysis of the data. So although there will be a single figure and a statement, what then follows is a, a, a precy of the, the statistical variation and what it means in terms of probability. Mm. And, and all the information is there, in a sense, to reverse engineer that result. So you can look at that result and say, yeah, okay, so how really, that, that's a very, you know, there's a lot of variation in that. Does it, is it really doing what he thinks it's doing? And, and so that's, that is, you can't be a biologist. Or, or let me rephrase that. Uh, you can't be a, a whole organism biologist um, look, interested in evolutionary processes uh, or, or emergent properties of the whole animal uh, unless you understand statistics. And it's actually it's one of the hardest things we grapple with with students because students come to our department, they're, they're, they're you know, very gifted, very focused on whole organisms. They, they have a lot of information particularly because you know television programs and outreach is so good these days. And then we tell them in the second year, you're going to spend 20 credits learning about stats. And you, their little faces drop. You know, well, we didn't come here to do maths. <laughs> no, but biology is about variation. You can't, nothing in biology makes sense without evolution. Evolution doesn't make sense without variation. And so they have to do stats. So it's, it's absolutely, it's a fundamental core part of every biology program and zoology program in the country is statistics right. for that very reason it's part of our fabric yeah well, that's exactly uh, what I was uh, trying to uh, come with now so it's clear to me now that you see uncertainty as part of the fabric yeah. of, if yeah. not the universe at least um, yeah. of, of your of certainly the of the living universe uh, yeah which is our experience of it yeah that's that would be the case fantastic but but there is another area of biology that deals with uncertainty in a slightly different way and uh, global climate change is is a very important issue um, and a lot of people are working on it and a lot of people are generating data on it so how do you do that? We, we have only have one Earth, the sample size is one, and that kind you of cannot, defies the way that you, you do experimentation. Yeah. So the way, the way that uh, people who do this work on it is they, they adopt one of two approaches, often intermingling both of those approaches. One is to go back through past environments, or go back th through time, and look at past environments. And, and although it sounds a bit far-fetched, you can actually understand an awful lot about atmospheric conditions, atmospheric gas conditions and so on by looking at rocks and so on that were and you can date those rocks very precisely. So so those data are, are actually very robust. And as you work back and understand those things, you can map different features of the Earth at different times into a, a kind of multi-dimensional understanding of what's going on. And therein lies the problem. Um, you've got a lot of things that might be affecting each other. And so the patterns, you can't assume that the patterns you see are the patterns that you would see today. So the consequence of that is you build a model, or you build lots of models actually, and the models have assumptions built into them that, you know, that we can look at and we can say, yes, those are realistic assumptions or those are ridiculous assumptions. And when you do that and you build a, create a model of what past climates were like or what current climates might be like, what you see within each model, of course, is a degree of uncertainty. Um, but, but what's in, even more interesting is when you look between models that are actually very similar, the lines that you get for what, for example, atmospheric CO2 was like, or, or, or global temperature was like, 
you see that the lines are often following the same patterns but are in different places mm. and and of course that's an uncertainty that's generated by the assumptions that you're putting into the model and 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 so actually the the science of predicting the nature of global climate change and understanding paleo environments is, is to a very large extent about understanding uncertainties in, in models, mm -hmm. particularly generated by very complex models. And, and in a sense, that's possibly part of the reason why this controversy about whether there is man-made global warming or not exists, because, because the people who are arguing against it don't understand the nature of, of, of the techniques that are being used to understand the process. The uncertainty is of course critical and acknowledged and and if you take you know if you put a hundred models uh, and look at where the lines from those hundred models are they're all over the place they're, well they're not all over the place they're but all doing they, roughly the same thing but, but they spread cover a range. yeah and so so to go back to your original question how how is uncertainty dealt with in that situation well it's it it's at, it's often represented visually of course it's represented statistically as well but it's represented um visually by by these huge bands of uncertainty around the central figure. And, and we do that as well, of course, in biology. We have ways of representing.